a fantastic and very rewarding career that if you're lucky enough to get involved with, I think you'll, you know, it'll be, it'll be great. Somebody said to me earlier, um, I don't know who, who it was, who, that how you, journalism is not going to be as rewarding as medicine or being a doctor. Who was that then? Yeah. <laughs> Look, the back of the red t-shirt, I'll shame. And it was funny because it's, it's uh, something that I've always thought about journalism being extremely rewarding. And the story I was going to talk to you about today was not to do with the personal column I write, which um, I, I described earlier on to somebody else as a sort of one long tweet every week. I'm not twittering, as a twittering see, the, is that the right language? Twittering? Tweeting, see? I'm not tweeting yet, but I've actually been given a Twitter t tutorial earlier on, so I might start. But um, my personal column is, is that kind of thing. It's, you know, almost what I've had for breakfast or the things that are going in, on in my life. And it's not uh, the hard-hitting kind of journalism that, um, you know, a lot of people would aspire to. But a couple of years ago, I did a story which I did find very rewarding because it made a difference. And I think um, getting into journalism for the right reason is getting into it because you'd like to make a difference and like to see changes um, happen where they should happen. Um, I got an email from somebody who told me about a counselling centre in Dublin where people were going in because they were vulnerable, as people do when they're going for counselling, whether they had problems with alcohol or relationships or various issues going on in their lives. But once they were in this counselling centre, they were then being asked for very large sums of money um, to essentially, what the people were saying, make their dreams come true. So they were being told that if you give me this amount of money, I can make your wildest dreams come true. You can get a house, a car, everything. And these people who were in the first place coming for some serious help with problems in their lives were then being sort of told that if they gave this money, you know, all this other stuff would happen. And you can imagine, if you're in a vulnerable position in the first place, it might sound to us like, well, that's crazy. Why would you hand over money to, to people in that context? But if you're in a vulnerable position and your life isn't going the way you would like it to go, then you might uh, be persuaded that way. Anyway, I got this email from someone who told me a little bit about this happening. And I suppose it was kind of you know, once I, I got this idea that this was going on, you just want to uncover it and you just want to find out, is it true? And you need people to back up the story. So I spent quite a long time um, getting people, because it was hard to persuade someone. If you can imagine, if you were that person who'd handed over, say, 100,000 euro in, one, in the case of one man, to, to admit that to somebody and to stand over that, put your name to it, would be quite hard because you feel quite humiliated and, like, and silly and that your friends are going to be laughing at you. But anyway, one guy did and then another person did. And in the end, I got three or four accounts from people who um, were, were willing to stand over the fact that they had been exploited by this counselling centre, where hundreds and hundreds of people were going every day to, to seek help. Um, so the upshot of it was I had to meet the person who was the head of the counselling centre, who was the person engaged in all these activities, which um, even though I've been in journalism for you know over 10 years, it was still quite daunting because here I was going to present her with this evidence that I'd accumulated, and uh, you know, it was something that you know she was going to probably deny. But I needed to get her on tape saying, "Yes, I did ask these people for this money. Yes, I did get this money." And I spent two and a half hours um, talking to her in a, in a city centre hotel because she was the most slippery customer I've ever come across, and <laughs> not surprisingly, very manipulative. And everything I said, she tried to twist around. And I had all these accounts, and I was like, "But this person said that you did this, and this person said this." And she just kept turning it around until finally, I think, I, it was like getting a bit between your teeth, you know, I just, she started to annoy me so much, I just wouldn't let it go. And at the end, she basically said, yes, okay, I did. I did that, and I did that. And it was a very, a very good feeling. Um, and I went on and did the story. And what I was saying about being a rewarding job, I did that story, and it meant a few things. I mean, counselling is a really um, unregulated area, and uh, it, it means that greater scrutiny will come on it. I mean, unfortunately, it hasn't meant that any new laws have come in, maybe... I mean, Ryan could have a word or something, but somebody can still set up and, and put counsellor outside their door and, and uh, you know, offer help to very vulnerable people. But it did put the spotlight on it, it did that. I mean, a lot of people got their money back, which is brilliant. So, I mean, these people were getting checks from this counselling centre who had to admit that what they had done was not, wasn't right. And so there was repercussions. And I think in all the, while I love writing the personal column, I love writing about my life, it's a great privilege. I mean, it's, yeah, some people go, well, that's a real jammy job writing about your life. And it, I like to say it's not, as, it's not as easy as it looks. So probably sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. But it's great, it's great fun. But I suppose why I would have got into journalism in the first place was an idea that by writing about things, by exposing um, practices that shouldn't happen, that you can make a difference. And, and those have been the most rewarding stories that, that I would have done. But I'd like to think that um, in whatever shape media is in the future, when, when you come to be practicing it or reading it or, or listening to it, 
that, that's always the motivating factor behind it. And I agree with uh, Mick that the, the filter does seem to be gone. But I think as long as there's that motivation where people want to expose injustices and want um, to make positive changes, that uh, as long as that's the motivation, then hopefully you'll be doing something right. Um, and yeah, so that's, that's pretty much it. I, I, I know there's a lot of doom and gloom around, but I think there will still be jobs. And I like to think that whatever happens, people will still want to try to hold in their hands and look at. I mean, maybe I'm naive in that, but I kind of hope that there will be that desire among people and that it won't all be online and that it will all settle down eventually. Um, yeah, we're going to have a glass half empty, glass half full person here, sorry. Uh, so thanks very much for listening.